Who is allowed to represent who? Can you only represent a group you're part of? If so, how narrowly can a Northern queer woman represent the North, or just the woman's North, or just the queer woman's North? There is a danger in talking about or for groups. They can perpetuate stereotypes about the group. Linda Alfkoff proposes that in talking about a group, you are representing them and therefore talking for them. And in talking for a group, you must also talk about them to express your point. She also poses that the practice of speaking for others is often born of a desire for mastery, to privilege oneself as the one who more correctly understands the truth about another's situation, or as one who can champion a just cause and thus achieve glory and praise. She also says that this development should not be taken as an absolute disauthorization of all practices of speaking for, it is not always the case that when others, unlike me, speak for me, I have ended up worse off, or that when we speak for others, they end up worse off. Sometimes, as Lois Stewart has argued, we do need a messenger to advocate for our needs. I'd like to pose a case that looks at both sides of this argument in relation to the working class or the focus on representations of minors in art, where representing a group from the outside has offered a new perspective, and also where representations of the group have followed stereotypes and perhaps palmed perceptions of the groups. I'll begin by talking about the Ashington Group, better known as the Pittman Painters. The Ashington Group was an art appreciation society formed the village Ashington next to the colliery by Robert Lyon, Master of Painting at Armstrong College, then part of Durham University. I'll look at two different works, one by Oliver Kilbourne and one by Harry Wilson. Both these works are met by members of the Ashington Group. Both works depict the end of a shift in the mine. One, The Off Shift by Kilbourne, and one, The Two Shifts by Harry Wilson. Kilbourne was a miner and worked in the pit, whereas Harry Wilson worked as a dental engineer. I can unfortunately only find a black and white copy of his painting. Wilson's work as an observer who was immersed in the scene and with the people that make it for many years is full of feeling. He shows the contrast between the tired forms of the miners coming off shifts and quickly dispersing home against the next shift, waiting and chatting together before heading into the pit. Kilbourne, however, as a miner himself, depicts the men more personally and the scene is more detailed, but leaves out a lot of feelings that feature in Wilson's work. He admitted himself, It never occurred to me that there was more to the subject than an everyday job, something Wilson, as an onlooker, can pick out. When Henry Moore spent two weeks at Wheeldale Colliery, where his father used to work, he said, if one was asked to describe what hell would be like, this would do. In his depictions of the miners, they're taken to symbolise victimisation and a noble toil working underneath the ground during wartime. However, Oliver Kilbourne, part of the Ashington group, says, he misses part out. His pit drawings are not of real live miners because he does not understand what was about. He said, right from the beginning, Moore's drawings were static because he made them as sculptures, therefore they remained lifeless like his sculpture. Works in the pit as depicted by Kilbourne and fellow miner and member of the Ashington group Jimmy Floyd is different. Still dark and claustrophobic as Moore's work, they are full of sound and movement and life. There is more of a focus on miners rather than them just being vague shapes and silhouettes. The lighting is more dramatic, the shadows from the torches are cast all over giving life to the work. Floyd's work looks at moments of respite and involves smaller, darker personal details omitted by Moore. A man sharing a sandwich with a pit pony and the coats hanging on the wall. Moore's work, though emotive, seems to omit part of the miners' humanity, seen as merely workers toiling underground. But this representation does have its merits in showing normal people what mining work was like. It is incredibly dangerous and dark and quite terrifying. But without the faces of the miners, it makes it harder to empathise with them. Maybe it, it could just depict any scene. Maybe it really is just depicting a scene from hell. Documentary films at the time tended to use mass observation techniques to observe the working class. Spare Time, directed by Humphrey Jennings, looks at what working class people do in their spare time. Go to the pub, the races, play music, dance, look after their dogs and pigeons. But in observing people like this, it ends up presenting them as bizarre and other, whose customs are strange and confusing. It presents them as less than the viewer. Tom Harrison, 
author of Savage Civilization, visited the group for a week, looking to see if they would be suitable for his work, Mass Observation, accompanied by Julian Trevelyan. They arrived with preconceived notions of life in the mining town, expecting working men who drank a lot and enjoyed dog racing, as presented in spare time, expecting hard-edged, intimidating man like from the documentary Coalface or The English at Home. George Orwell described miners as exhausted faces with grime clinging in all the hollows, having a fierce and wild look. Harrison came to the quick conclusion about the Ashington group, describing it as the oddest of sights, a little dilapidated room full of men in working clothes, all sitting around turning out these pictures without any effort or even any apparent thought. It is clear Harrison's perception has been greatly warped by time spent in exclusive clubs, otherwise he may have noticed that all of the men are wearing shirts and ties, clearly not mining workers' clothes, as shown in Trevelyan's photos. However, he did give some credit to the group, saying, Everyone painting straight out of their mind without preliminary sketches or looking at things, yet often with the accuracy and intimacy that one can scarcely credit it. His preconceived notions about what the Ashington group would be like show the damage that can be done by misrepresentations of groups by outer sources. If he instead paid attention to presentations of miners by miners, such as the Ashington group's paintings, he may not have looked down at them in the way that he did. However, from Harrison's stay with the group, the idea came up to hold an exhibition of unprofessional painting. The Ashington Group Hut was knocked down in 1983, and the group disbanded in 1984, the same year that the strikes against pit closures began. The strike birthed new art coming from mining communities, protest art in posters and banners, cartoons and badges, taking inspiration from communist propaganda. Ken Loach, a leftist filmmaker, created a documentary, Which Side Are You On?, presenting the mining strike. His documentary, instead of talking for or about miners, gave the community themselves their own voice and amplified it. To our colliery where there's 1,100 men employed, once that colliery closes, there's all communities die. However, newspapers at the time deemed the strikes illegal and suggested that a lot of the violence was caused by the miners' side and not by the police. In modern art, however, Representation of the strike has changed dramatically, such as in the 2000 film Billy Elliot. The focus is not necessarily on the strike, but it does boldly depict the police brutality faced by striking miners, a representation that holds true, as I have spoken to miners and they've often talked about how the police used to kick the shins of the men in the picket line with their steel toe cat boots. Documentation of this in the Battle of Orgreave where police attacked and tried to frame 95 striking miners. Later charges were dismissed and the media depicted as an act of self-defence by the police. However, this is being investigated in 2020. There is also the 2014 film Pride, directed by Matthew Walkers. It doesn't dwell much on the horrors of the Thatcher government, instead choosing to focus on the LDSM group. Lesbians and gays support the miners, which form to support miners in Wales. There are mentions of how Thatcher's regime is affecting both groups, but is it a film about solidarity and community, looking at how these two oppressed groups manage to band together, at least for a little while? Neither of these films are directed by people who were in the strikes, or even working class. Both miss out on a lot of brutality by the police, and the cold and the hunger of the strike over winter, and the damage that Margaret Thatcher's government did to queer representation. However, these films do bolster up the voices of the working class and queer people. And I find that in a way that that re sort of representation, even by people outside of a community, is vitally important. Otherwise, otherwise, people who are outside of the community might never get to hear other people's perspectives.